In the early 1960s, the world watched as the Mercury 7, America's first astronauts, led the United States into space. What the world didn't know was that 13 American women had also qualified to become astronauts. But none of them ever got a chance to fly in space. They had the right stuff, but the wrong sex. Join us as we travel in search of history and unveil the story of the Mercury 13 Secret Astronauts. On February 2nd, 1995, Space Shuttle Discovery sat poised for liftoff on Pad 39B at Florida's Kennedy Space Center. Mission Control passed the word. All systems were go. Mission STS-63 looked to be another routine shuttle flight. But there was something very special about this mission. For the first time, the pilot's seat was to be occupied by a woman. A former test pilot named Eileen Collins. The 39-year-old Air Force Lieutenant Colonel from Elmira, New York, would become, in a few moments, the first woman astronaut to pilot an American spacecraft. But then, for technical reasons, NASA had to postpone the shuttle launch by 24 hours. For Eileen Collins and her fellow crew members, it was a frustrating delay. But in the history of women in aviation, it was just a minor setback in a long and difficult journey. Four, three, two, one. And we have liftoff. The spectacular liftoff of Discovery with Eileen Collins at the controls fulfilled the long-delayed promise of equality for women pilots. It's a quest that began long before there was a space shuttle long before there was even a space program. The dream of equal rights and equal flights for women aviators is as old as aviation itself. In 1910, a journalist from New York named Harriet Quimby refused to take no for an answer and finally convinced a male flight instructor to teach her to fly. After a few short lessons, Quimby became the first woman to earn a pilot's license in the United States. Harry Quimby used to dress in a plum-colored velvet flying suit. She had a big sort of hood that she would put over her head. And I mean, people just loved it. Just ate it up with a spoon. Quimby took her flying seriously. In April 1912, she became the first woman to fly across the English Channel. An event which would have gotten her a lot more acclaim had it not been the fact that the Titanic sank the night after her flight. And unfortunately, the newspaper headlines did not read, Harriet flies the Channel, but Titanic sinks. Three months later, on her way to an air show, Quimby tumbled from the open cockpit of her plane and was killed. But risks didn't stop women from pursuing their dreams. During the 1920s, female pilots were still regarded as novelties. They were called flying flappers and petticoat pilots. The organization that verified speed and altitude records, the International Aeronautical Federation, listed the achievements of women as merely miscellaneous air performances. But the women were more than death-defying attractions at air shows. They were, in essence, test pilots. A lot of the air racing and the altitude records were doing more than just winning awards for their pilots. They also proved what aircraft could do. How high could a certain aircraft go? How long could it travel? And that's very, very important. In 1929, the Federation finally changed its policy and officially recognized the record-breaking flights of women. 
On August 14th of that year, 20 female pilots gathered in Santa Monica, California for the first annual Women's Air Derby. It was a grueling eight-day race from California to Cleveland, Ohio, that the press dubbed the Powder Puff Derby. 23-year-old Louise Thayden finished first. The Powder Puff Derby did more than showcase the skills of women pilots. It gave women pilots the opportunity to meet one another, many for the first time. Building on their newfound camaraderie, they decided to create an association of female pilots. Since 99 of the 126 licensed female pilots pledged their support, the group named itself the 99s. They elected 32-year-old Amelia Earhart as their first president. Earhart had gained a great deal of notoriety with her transatlantic flight in 1928 and used her newfound fame to encourage women to fly. I think her essential message was, um, if you're a woman, don't let obstacles stand in the way. Don't take obstacles for granted. If you want something, if you have a goal, go do it. An ambitious entrepreneur from Florida named Jacqueline Cochran heeded Earhart's advice. In the early 1930s, Cochran worked as a beautician and sold cosmetics. Rather than waste time driving to her customers, she figured that flying would be more efficient. In 1932, Cochran took some flying lessons. Something stuck. It's like a Roman candle went off in her brain. And she said, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And when Amelia Earhart disappeared, Jackie Cochran was right there to step into her shoes. It wasn't long before Cochran was breaking speed and distance records. In 1938, she won the prestigious Bendix Air Race by flying from Burbank, California to Cleveland in eight hours and 10 minutes. In 1940, she set a new world speed record of 332 miles per hour, faster than any woman or man had ever flown. When America entered World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, Jackie Cochran saw an opportunity for women to help with the war effort. She convinced General Hap Arnold, the commanding general of the Army Air Forces, that women pilots could be used to fly newly built warplanes from the factories to the airfields. General Arnold liked the idea and in 1943 created the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. He appointed Jackie Cochran as one of the directors of the program. 25,000 women applied for only 1,000 positions. After flight training, they received their wings and joined the new flying unit. With women flying behind the lines, male pilots were freed for combat duty. A new era had begun. For the first time, American women were flying military aircraft. Women pilots risked their lives right alongside the men. During the war, 38 wasps died in accidents. Decades later, however, investigations revealed a frightening fact. Some of the women had died as a result of sabotage but who tampered with their planes remains uncertain. By the fall of 1944, unemployed male pilots protested that the women had taken their jobs and the WASP program was disbanded. At the end of the war, people said it is on the record that women can fly. But immediately, the question changed from could they, can they, to should they? That's a sociological question. That reflects our society's values. And the answer in 1945 was no, they should not. But social 